Good morning. Uh, it is a privilege uh, to come again together and study God's Word uh, with you this morning. Uh, it's the foundation of our fellowship um, together uh, in our worship. And uh, this time that we have uh, this morning, it's a great privilege uh, and a blessing. Um, <clears throat> whenever I'm asked to stand uh, uh, behind uh, this lectern, I, I'm acutely aware that I'm standing in the footsteps of giants. Um, but that is true, really, for all of us uh, this morning when we consider what we hold in our hands, the Word of God, um, and how it has been preserved uh, uh, by God's sovereign providence. Uh, we really do stand in the footprints of giants. His holy word, divine revelation, preserved for us and provided in our own, in our own language um, so that we may know the triune God and walk in his ways, um, the way of righteousness, the way of life, the good life. Um, Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet, um, <clears throat> and he ministered uh, to a rebellious people um, uh, in Judah. Uh, he appealed to his countrymen to repent. He called them to repentance. He spoke of the coming judgment to Judah, uh, the future messianic kingdom, and he pointed to the vital role of God's word uh, in life, um, the way of life, the good life. Jeremiah 6.16, um, he writes, Stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it that you may find rest for your souls. Paul wrote of a similar uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, encouragement to the saints in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them, walking in the way of righteousness and according to God's word. Our text this morning, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, points us in that same direction. Um, <clears throat> I guess if I had to title it, I would title it, Living in the Light of God's Great Mercies. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. May God bless our hour together, and uh, I would ask that we um, go again before the throne in prayer. <clears throat> Dearly Father, we thank you for this time that we have this morning. We thank you for your son, for his effectual work on the cross in whom your people are declared righteous uh, by, the sovereign, by your sovereign, sovereign grace through faith. We thank you for uh, your eternal uh, holy word uh, preserved throughout history at a great cost of many who have gone before us. Uh, we thank you for your word, which is uh, solely sufficient to know you um, and solely sufficient uh, for life and godliness. Um, we pray that you would direct our hearts and our minds towards you this morning um, as we approach um, uh, your table, uh, which is really the, the, the main uh, focus of our worship uh, together. Uh, highlight our worship this morning that we would remember and reflect deeply on what you have done uh, for us. Uh, your great love fully displayed uh, in the person and work of your Son, uh, in whom is our everlasting hope. Uh, uh, and may he alone receive um, all the glory and, and honor in our time this morning. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Our text this morning begins with that word, therefore. Um, we've been looking at therefore texts on Wednesday evening in a, in a short series, and we've been looking at um, these therefore passages. Therefore is an important word 
um, when studying scripture. It's a conjunctive adverb and it points, it provides emphasis um, to introduce an argument <clears throat> that denotes a result or a conclusion. It highlights uh, what has preceded before it with purpose and application. In Romans, there are uh, several great therefore passages um, highlighted in ahead of us. So there's Romans 2, chapter 2, verse 1. It's the therefore of condemnation. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, there's the therefore of justification. In Romans 8, verse 1, there's the therefore of preservation. And then here before us is chapter 12, verse 1, the therefore of sanctification. Uh, our text this morning opens with that great conjunction, therefore. Um, this is a pivotal transition in the book of Romans uh, that Paul shifts now towards the application of all that he has laid out before us from chapter 1 to chapter 11. Paul transitions and reminds the readers of who his audience is, his intended audience. Therefore, I urge you, brethren. He goes uh, from chapter 1 through 11, he has laid before his audience the great doctrines of sovereign grace and sovereign mercies. And here he continues and he reminds the audience specifically who he's writing to, the brethren. In chapter 1, he introduces them as the called, the called of Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus. And in verse 7, he addresses them as to all who are beloved of God as well as the called, to the called as saints, to those called as saints. Called as ones who are set apart, set apart from the fallen world, uh, set apart to be holy other, uh, to be set apart in his uh, heavenly kingdom service, uh, to those called as saints, um, set apart for God's service, for his glory. From the very start, Paul is specifically addressing the recipients as the, uh, the recipients of the effectual calling. That effectual calling was evidenced through their faith, and their faith was evidenced through their obedience, through their walk in Him, in their deeds, through their deeds. And this was evidenced to the world, to the outside world. Uh, verse, chapter 1, verse 8. Therefore, I thank my God through Christ Jesus. Therefore, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. That's the audience, these brethren. Paul is addressing in chapter 12, verse 1. Paul's use of the word brethren is not intended only for men, but the family of God as brothers in Christ, as co-heirs with every right and privilege as a son co-heirs in Christ, together the family of God. Notice the language here that Paul, um, in Paul's command, therefore I urge you, brethren, I urge you, in that letter, uh, in a letter uh, characterized by God's sovereign grace, uh, Paul saturates his language with grace. I urge you, I urge you, brethren. This is the language of grace not the language of law, but rather I urge you. The root here, I urge, to urge is to call alongside to help. Perhaps as a coach who would run alongside uh, their pupil in a race, urging them forward. Uh, as a father, perhaps, who comes alongside a son, urging him in the way that he should not depart. Or perhaps as a mentor, uh, to a mentee, encouraging them in excellence in their craft. Um, Paul here comes alongside the saints to help, to urge them, to guide, to exhort in the way of the new life in Christ, the upward life, the good life. Many of you don't realize it, but the, our, our fellowship together, uh, you have done this for me for years. Uh, as long as I've been a husband, you have urged me as, along. Um, as long as I've been a father, you've urged me along in your own walk with Christ as I observe your faith in work outwardly. You urge me along, and that is the right fellowship of the saints. We urge one another along. We sharpen one another. That's the right 
fellowship within the church. But here, Paul is not merely urging them in his own self. He's not coming alongside the self, the saints, uh, to help them and urging them forward. Um, but rather, he is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And that's the Holy Spirit among our fellowship that urges us along. Um, not in our merit, but in, in the work, in the inward work, and the outward work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. This is Paul, who is inspired by the Holy Spirit. He has received his apostleship by the power of the Holy Spirit, according to the Holy Spirit. He introduces himself in that way in Romans 1, who is coming alongside, urging the saints forward. And so this, being God's inspired word, his effect, in effect, is the Holy Spirit urging along the saints. He is our very present help, um, our helper, um, who not only comes alongside us, but indwells us uh, in each and every saint in full. He's not a liquid that you have a, a small portion of the Holy Spirit and another, a more fuller, but the whole third person of the Trinity indwells each and every believer in full. It is a gift. He is a gift given to help and to guide to teach, to admonish, to encourage, to come alongside us, within us. Not urging us, um, merely rooting for us, but urging us in his power, in his power that is effectual and effective. Uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are urged forward in God's holy word. Uh, and, by, and this is all by the mercies of God. Paul spent the first 11 chapters 16 chapters long, two-thirds of this book outlining the mercies of God. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. By the mercies of God, he emphasizes divine grace of God, divine mercies of God, uh, sovereign mercies, sovereign grace. And we often sing, um, it's requested often in the in the Lord's Supper meeting, a debtor to mercy alone, of covenant mercy I sing. No fear with thy righteousness on, my person an offering to bring. The terrors of law and of God with me can have nothing to do. My Savior's obedience and blood hide all my transgressions from view. And that's what we see dedicated in the first 11 chapters of Romans the great sovereign mercies of God. Uh, more than two-thirds of this letter with great emphasis, the sovereign grace and mercies of God by which he effectually and irresistibly called those who were wholly unable uh, to come on our own volition, on our own merits and will. We were totally depraved. He outlines it in great detail, totally corrupt and in our, in our fallen nature, born spiritually dead, totally unable to move one step close to righteousness, uh, to godliness, towards holiness um, in our meritless efforts. Uh, we were by nature enemies, enemies of God. With none righteous, not even one, he would write, none who understand God, there is none who seeks for God and in and of ourselves, we are helpless. And yet, by the mercies and grace of God, he elected those his own unconditionally in eternity past. He set his own son, he sent his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, at the right time in his sovereign time to justify the many, to justify the elect as a gift um, by his grace through the redemption, which is only found in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And by his great mercies, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, was displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood. I'm just quoting, citing, you'll recognize this is Romans, one through, chapter 1 through 11, to satisfy God's righteousness at the cross, solely and specifically for his innumerable elect that no man can number. A great many, even the faith required is received uh, as, a gra as a grace and mercies of God. The belief required to know and trust the Lord Jesus Christ is all wrapped 
in that gift of God's great mercies and grace. We are justified through faith and have peace with God. Paul expounds all these wondrous mercies of God uh, with detail. By the mercies of God, our dead, our old dead nature is buried with Christ in his death, and we are made anew and walk to walk in the newness of life, united with him, alive in Christ by the mercies of God. Not only this, but we are eternally secure in him by the mercies of God. His people will persevere, the perseverance of the saints, or rather perseverance of Christ in the saints, because he is faithful to his own. He perseveres in us, and nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of God, can separate any of his elect from God's love. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. He is faithful to save and to save. He does to the uttermost, to the utmost. And this is the full sovereign grace and mercies of God that Paul dedicates over two-thirds of this letter. He doesn't start with doing. He starts with knowing. He starts with the knowledge of these precious doctrinal truths that are intimate and experiential and practical in every way. Not a single doctrine that we find is impractical. All doctrine given to us from above is practical for us. Indeed, they are essential. They are essential for the Christian life, for the life of every believer. And these magnificent doctrinal truths of God's great mercy caused Paul, uh, as if spontaneously, uh, to burst out with that great doxology of praise in the previous text from verses 31, uh, sorry, 33 and 36 through 36 <clears throat> in chapter 11. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfath unfathomable, unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that he might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory for, forever. Amen. That is what the therefore is therefore in our text this morning. In light of these marvelous and precious doctrinal truths, in light of God's great mercies poured out for many, poured out if you are in Christ, poured out for you, I urge you, my fellow saints, brothers, co-heirs, to live in light of who you now are. Put into practice all the practical doctrine that I've laid out before you. It saddens me um, to hear, and I know it saddens many of you when you hear a friend or a colleague or maybe even a family member um, share with you at our church we don't really emphasize doctrine uh, the, all that academic uh, stuff uh, we emphasize doing we emphasize living uh, the Christian life or experiencing God um, it's even sadder and I've heard this um, in, in, a, in, in, in private conversation um, who would call themselves shepherds uh, not here at the chapel, who would privately say, we hold to these doctrinal truths, but they aren't really appropriate uh, for the pulpit uh, because they can be divisive. Uh, it's better that we have these conversations on, in one-on-one -on -one private um, conversations. I've met a few who've used those, those exact words, um, and I'm sure you have as well. Um, and it's not only sad, it's dangerous. It's dangerous for the Christian life uh, and the life of the believer to walk in those ancient paths. To walk faithfully in the ancient paths, we must study the ancient truths uh, that we have before us. That sound biblical doctrine. And here Paul has put biblical doctrine on the bullhorn before us. It's the central emphasis of all of his letters. Uh, to emphasize uh, is the emphasis of, of our Lord. To know him and to know him rightly. Uh, but knowing him isn't merely academic knowledge for the sake of gathering of knowledge in a heady way, but knowledge about him is intimately knowing him, 
knowing the Lord intimately and experientially. Um, This is where Paul shifts in his exhortation. By the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Paul is clearly using sacrificial language here. It's temple language um, uh, uh, for every uh, uh, true believer in Christ. This is the application of the elect people of God. To have this attitude which was in Christ Jesus, he offered himself as a sacrifice to us. And now present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. In our English translations, we see the word present very early in the context of the incarnation of Christ when he came. Uh, It's used in the offering presented uh, by the Magi, the wise men from the east. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, And after they came into the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented to him the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They presented the best that they had to offer uh, in in material um, sense to the Lord. Here our word in the text is different than the word used in Matthew. In English, it's presented. But here, uh, the wise men presented what was a, a gift to bring, uh, to offer uh, as a gift. It's also used in sacrifices, but it's the, the bringing of, the, of a thing, of a gift, of a sacrifice. But here, the word in Romans 12 has a, has a different nuance. Um, yes, it is to present or to place beside, but its meaning Um, is to come up to, uh, to stand by, or to stand close beside, or to appear before, or appear beside. It's not only presenting of a thing, but the presenting of one's self, to present yourself as a holy and living sacrifice, as a living and holy sacrifice. The presenting of one's very self in the presence of God. That word is used... um, Uh, The same word is used slightly in a different um, uh, meaning in Mark chapter 15, verse 39, when the centurion uh, says, when the centurion who was standing right in front of him, that's the same word, who was standing right in front of him, saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Standing right in front of him, presented before him, In the presence of God, present your bodies, present your very self, your whole self, which includes your physical self, uh, as a living and holy sacrifice. The difference between the language here in our text of that sacrificial system in the temple um, is the nature and condition of the sacrifice uh, being offered, presented in the very presence of God. The sacrifices of the Old Testament were a bloody sacrifice, a sacrifice of death. Uh, uh, Blood flowed month after month, well, year after year, month after month, week after week, day after day. A bloody sacrifice was presented in the presence of God in the temple. Blood flowed. The wages of sin is death. And due unto a sin, a sacrifice was required. A bloody sacrifice, um, which shadowed Uh, pointing to the ultimate, which would be uh, provided by divine decree. It was pointed to that suffering servant that we see in Isaiah 53, to the Lamb of God who would offer his life, would pour out his life, pour out his body and his blood as a ransom for an innumerable many, an incalculable many. His blood would be shed, poured out to satisfy God's justice, (coughs) and wrath as a propitiation for our sin, as a substitute. The Lord Jesus Christ died so that we would have life. Uh, Jesus said in John 10.10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. His death has brought us life, an abundant life the good life. Do you know him? Do you know the abundant life experientially, 
It is bound up in the death and the burial and the resurrection and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. He presented himself once and for all a sacrifice for many in the presence of God in whom we are fully reconciled in his death, in the death of his son. Um, and we are to live and now present ourselves as a living sacrifice, uh, present ourselves in the presence of God as ones who have been fully reconciled before God, living in him abundantly. Um, this is not a gloomy sacrifice. I don't think we can read this text in a, in a melancholy way. Um, this isn't a gloomy uh, self-flagellation going around whipping our backs as if we're pleasing the Lord in our own suffering, but rather the language here is of joy and gratitude, uh, a living sacrifice because the death that has been required has uh, conquered and been made, and we are made spiritually alive in him. Not just a living sacrifice, but we are to live as a holy sacrifice in our lives. The same language is found in Romans chapter 6. Uh, you can turn there if you like. I'll read Romans 6, 11 through 14. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting your members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, as your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And this is our very motive to present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice, for we have a new nature. Uh, we have been washed and cleansed by the blood of the land and made alive in him, if you are in him. Uh, that joy would show through your outward work of service, your countenance, your body presented before him, a living and holy sacrifice. <clears throat> this is who we are in Christ. This is our new nature in him. Our new identity is bound up in Christ. We are made acceptable to God. This is our spiritual service of worship, that we should uh, have our, our hearts should be filled with anything. Uh, our hearts, how can our hearts be filled with anything other than gratitude and joy. Um, yes, circumstances of life come, but we have the assurance in our heart. Uh, we have nothing to hold in our heart but gratitude to the Lord Jesus Christ and our lives to those who have been redeemed in Christ, overflowing with gratitude uh, for his uh, immeasurable work. That's the Christian life, a living sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. A living sacrifice with hearts of gratitude for all that has been accomplished for us by his rich mercies, by the mercies of God. Paul goes on to exhort the saints, and do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word conformed to this world, conformed to this present age, to this temporal age, the temporal fallen world as saints, we are not to be conformed to it because we are no longer a part of it. We no longer belong to that fallen temporal world that we see um, uh, today that we're in, uh, that we are to be uh, in the world, but not of the world. We are to be conformed. We are no longer of it. We are no longer enslaved to it. Uh, to this temporal age is no longer our master. Uh, for the believer, for the believer to outwardly conform uh, to the pressures of this fallen world, to all its enticements, is to act in direct contradiction of who we are, to who we are in Christ. That is to be conformed. It is conforming to that which you are not. 
uh, indeed, if you belong to him. Uh, we are not to be conformed, but we are to be continuously and progressively transformed. There is no idle uh, or stagnant uh, believer. There's no stagnant or idle Christian. One is either conforming or being transformed, transforming, moving forward and growing um, or being stunted in their walk by conforming to that which they no longer belong, if indeed uh, we are in Christ. That expression, to be transformed, is the word metamorphosis. It's where we get the word metamorphosis. It is the obvious outward change. Um, the same word we use for a caterpillar who changes into the butterfly. It's the same creature, but it is radically changed and obvious uh, before our sight. Uh, the outward change of the Christian life is to be noticeable and distinguished from that which characterizes the temporal fallen age in which we live. Uh, that's the metamorphosis of the Holy Spirit in the heart and life of a Christian. It exudes to the outward, to the countenance, to our, act, to our behavior, our conduct, it is to mirror that of Christ. The outward manifestation of the inward reality of the believer. The same word is used at the Mount of Transfiguration in which our Lord is witnessed in Matthew 17, verse 2. He was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments, because they, uh, because they were, uh, became white as snow. That's the same word. He was transfigured before them. This is how the people of God are to live outwardly, within our family, uh, within our communities, within our business, our workplace, within our school um, as students, uh, among other students. It is the public self, it's the private self, and it's the secret self. Um, and it begins in the mind. It begins in the secret recesses in which no one can see in our mind. That's what Paul exhorts the saints to offer their bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. And now he points them to where the battle is fought. It is fought in the mind. It is won or lost in the mind. How? By the renewing of your mind. Uh, by the renewing of your mind. That's where, this, that's where sanctification takes place. Um, and it is bound up in God's word. The mind uh, set upon the word of God. Uh, the Holy Spirit has done the work of regeneration unto faith, revealing the way by his word. And now the work of sanctification begins in the mind, in and through God's holy word. And is it driven and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Philippians 2.13, For it is God who is at work, both to will and to work, for his good pleasure. You all know well the first question of the Westminster Catechism. I bet if I asked a Coram Deo student, what is the uh, chief end of man, you would quickly respond, the chief end of man, man's chief end, is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But if I asked, what is question 35? <laughs> Could you answer that? Uh, uh, what is sanctification? What is sanctification? I like this definition. Sanctification is the work of God's free grace. One, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God. And two, are enabled more and more to die to sin and to live unto righteousness. Again, sanctification is the work of God's free grace. It is the work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God, his character, his nature. And we are enabled more and more to die into sin, more and more progressively, and live unto righteousness. That's a great definition. I like how William G.T. Shedd uh, describes sanctification. Sanctification results from the continuation of 
of the agency of the Holy Spirit after the act of regeneration, A, in the strengthening and augmenting existing graces, faith, hope, love, etc., and B, in exciting them to exercise, exciting them to exercise through the reading and hearing of his word, through the sacraments, or what we are about to do, the observance of the Lord's Supper, through prayer, even providences, afflictions, and chastisements. Hence, it is often called renewing. This use of the term is not synonymous with regeneration that has already occurred within the heart of every believer. Ephesians 4.23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Sanctification includes the entire man. It is gradual. Uh, it is both a grace and a duty, uh, the responsibility of every believer. And as sanctification, though, is progressive, it is a duty, but it is duty given. It is never complete in this life. We have never reached. We will always struggle. We will always wrestle. And that's the key. That's the key in our walk with Christ. In this earthly life, we will never reach the point where we can say, I have arrived. And yet, we do not wrestle and struggle alone. Uh, Shed writes, sanctification, once begun, is never wholly lost. It fluctuates in the fidelity of the believer. But he never falls back into the stupor of death of the unregenerate state. Every believer is kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. 1 Peter 1, 5. It is the grace of God through the power of the Holy Spirit that enables the responsibility and obedience. Philippians 2, 12 through 13. So then, my beloved, just, have you, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's the responsibility. Um, but here is the responsibility provided. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Our sanctification begins in our mind, a mind set to God's word. Romans 8, 6, the mind set on flesh is death. If you're here this, ex this evening, examine yourself. Is your mind set on the temporal things of this earth? Is it constantly enticed and falling to the things of this age? If it is, the mind set on flesh is death. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Colossians 3, verse 1 and 2, Therefore, if, or you could say, therefore, since, you have been raised up with Christ, keep think seeking the things above where Christ is, <coughs> seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We are to present ourselves as a living sacrifice in the presence of God, both in body and in mind. There should be consistency there in body and mind, renewed daily in his word. That's how we know God. That's how we know uh, the will of God. That's the primary means in which the Holy Spirit teaches us and leads us and helps us in our walk in Christ and produces that godly discernment. Uh, Isaiah 26, 3, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon thee, because he trusteth in thee, so that, so that you may prove what the will of God is. Calvin wrote, If renewal of the mind is necessary for the purpose of proving what the will of the Most High is, we may hence see how much the mind is opposed to God in itself, to prove, to prove, literally to test, to discern, to prove the genuous, genuineness of that which is tried, that is to prove what is the will of God. <laughs> the will of God, what is the will of God? If you're a graduating senior, 
That's probably a question you're asking yourself. What is God's will for my life? What is God's will? Um, The will of God is rooted in his perfect wisdom. In perfect wisdom, there's uh, several aspects of God's will. First, there's the decretive will of God, his sovereign efficacious will. Uh, When he spoke, let there be light, he issued a divine imperative in the exercise of his sovereign and efficacious will. And there was light. He did not coax the light into being or beg the light or command the light and hope for the best. Um, No, he spoke with sovereign authority and it came to be. That's God's decretive will. It was by God's decretive will that he called his people out of the darkness and into the marvelous light before the foundation of the, of the world. <clears throat> these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And, then he, and, and these who he justified, he also glorified. Well, that's not the will that, that is being spoken of here. It is the preceptive will of God, his precepts. Uh, his revealed commandments, his law, uh, in a sense, his preceptive will cannot be separated from his decretive will fully, uh, his moral will, his moral decree, because one cannot flee from God's precepts, his moral will with impunity. There will come a judgment where his law will uh, be declared um, and decreed. But in context here, this is his preceptive will, the moral will of God, according to the word, through God's word, the way in which we should walk according to his word, according to his will, his precepts. And he has prescribed that which is right for Christian living, for Christ likeness. We can only know God's precepts through his revealed word. That's, That's how we know and walk in his will. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. But that psalm begins in 119, verse 1. How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. They also do no unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. You have ordained your precepts, that we should walk in them diligently. You know Augustine's prayer well. Command what you will, but will what you command. This is the will of God. What is the will of God for your life? It is that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Again, that's borrowing uh, Old Testament sacrificial language to offer that which is good and acceptable and perfect. That is the will of God. That's the good life, the abundant life lived in accordance to God's word. Do you know him? Do you know him? If you are in him, then you can say with every confidence, as Paul did in Ephesians and Philippians 1, 6, for I am confident in this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Walk in his ways. Walk in his ways, the way of righteousness, the way of life. That's where the good life is found. And if you're in Christ, you, you know this. You know this well, um, and you're living this out. And we have hope in him. Uh, in spite of life circumstances, we can say with confidence that he will perfect it um, until the day of Christ Jesus. Either when he returns or we go to him and be with him and see him in all of his glory. Uh, For you have died, and your life is hidden in Christ, with Christ in God. Well, if you're here this morning, uh, you know uh, the secret recesses of your mind. Uh, You can only put a facade on for so long before you come to the throne of God and his preceptive will. You will find his prescriptive will. Uh, and in judgment and his righteousness. Turn to him, turn to him, look to him in the secret recesses of your mind. Be renewed in him, regenerated in him uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Come to him.
and faith. He rejects none who, who do. Uh, and you will find the abundant life. In your mind, you will find peace with God. Not only will you have the peace of, be at peace with God, but you will find the peace of God in your heart. Do you know it? Do you know it? Well, for those who do, we can rejoice with gratitude and go on from here with grateful hearts as we continue this day, our mind set on things of, the, of above, remembering soon the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ who poured out his life as a ransom for many. Well, may he have the glory this morning as we continue in our um, uh, the ministry of his word next and, and soon the worship of the Lord's Supper. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, these great truths, um, the calling with which you have called us um, is beyond our reach. Uh, in and of ourselves, uh, we cannot um, uh, attain to these things. And yet, you have poured upon us, who are in Christ, your Holy Spirit, who works these works in our heart, transforms us, renews us. Um, we pray that um, uh, you would grant us uh, the reflection by the power of your Holy Spirit to examine ourselves in accordance to your word and to grow. Um, you are faithful, and even uh, where and when we fail, and we do often, you are faithful to your people. And in that, you receive the glory, for you bring to full fruition that which we cannot bring in and of ourselves. And so we praise you, we thank you, uh, we pray that you would bring, a, a, encourage your people in this way, that we would look to you with full assurance and confidence. Um, we thank you for the full completion that awaits us, that we can speak as Paul spoke in the past tense, uh, for we too will be glorified uh, for those who are in Christ. That is our hope, um, tangible, um, experiential, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.